This passage here that we're going to be covering today is the conclusion to the series that we have been in for a really long time, Address the Mess, A Guide to Healthy Relationships, and just to bring everybody back up to speed in Romans chapter 12 and 13. We have been talking about our relationships with each other inside the church. We took several weeks to do that. And then we talked about our relationship with those who hurt us those who we might even consider to be our enemies. And then we took a couple weeks and we talked about our relationship with the government. And here in Romans chapter 13, verse 8, Paul brings it all back to the very foundation of any successful relationship. And he says at the beginning of verse 8, he says, Oh, no man, anything but to... Some of you are with me this morning. I know you're not looking at it. And I know that was a hard question. But to love one another. Owe no man anything but to love one another. The title of the message this morning is this, Master the Basics. Master the Basics. Now, as I was studying and going through this, I came across um, a quote, a statement that just caught my attention and about this passage, and here it is. The main thing is the plain thing, and the plain thing is the main thing. And that's what this passage is all about. Is anybody surprised that they would hear that the foundation to every successful relationship is love? All of you expect to hear that. In our hallway out there, we have the words, love God, love others. We know that love is extremely important. The main thing is the plain thing, and the plain thing is the main thing. And if you want to be truly successful in life, you know what we have to do? We must learn to master the basics. This is the basic, the foundation of the Christian life, love. How many of you agree? It takes a lifetime to earn a master's degree in love. Oh, man, it will try us and push us in every single way and in every single aspect of our life. So if you want to be truly successful, you have to master the basics. I want to play a clip um, by a man named Admiral William McRaven. He gave this uh, graduation speech um, a while back, and it has become very famous and very infamous. It's an incredible speech all the way through if you have the time to listen to it. But I'm just going to play about 40 seconds for you because it will really set the foundation of where we want to go this morning. So go ahead and play it. If you want to change the world, start off by making your bed. (laughs) If you make your bed every morning, you will have accomplished the first task of the day. It will give you a small sense of pride, and it will encourage you to do another task, and another, and another. And by the end of the day, that one task completed will have turned into many tasks completed. Making your bed will also reinforce the fact that the little things in life matter. If you can't do the little things right, you'll never be able to do the big things right. And if by chance you have a miserable day, you will come home to a bed that is made, that you made. And a made bed gives you encouragement that tomorrow will be better. What an awesome piece of advice right there. If you want to be successful in life, start off by making your bed. And all God's parents said, amen to that right there. Exactly. If you want to be successful in life. But what I really loved about what the point that he was driving home there is if we don't get the little things in life right, We'll never get the big things in life right. And that's the main point that we're driving home here. Now, yes, love is one of the big things of the Christian life. I mean, it is one of the main central tenets of the Christian life. But what we tend to do is we hear this stuff so often that we tend to just dismiss it. And we kind of cast it to the side, just like you do every morning when you woke up as a kid and your mom said, did you make your bed? Did you make your bed? Did you make your bed? And we can so easily skip over some of just those basic fundamentals that build good habits in our life if we're not careful. There's nothing that I'm going to say to you this morning that will probably shock you or surprise you or be different than what you've heard before. But the fundamental importance of making sure that we are mastering the basics, that we are doing this in our lives every single day will have a profound impact, not just on our graduates' life, but every single person that's here today. And yes, I could not have picked a more perfect passage for a graduate emphasis Sunday, but don't you think that just because you're not graduating and you never plan to go to school another day in your life, that this does not affect us all here today. Because as older people, we are examples to those that are coming up, and we ought to be living this out as an example every single day of our lives. So let's just jump right into it. Master the basics. The first thing that I want to start with is this. Live debt-free. Live debt-free. Look at verse 8. It says, Owe no man anything. 
Now, this reference here to debt makes perfect sense because if you go back to verse 7 to catch the context of what we're talking about, it all fits together perfectly and it makes sense. So let's read that. Help me out and read this out loud together with me, okay? Romans 13, verse 7, everybody out loud. Render, therefore, to all their dues, tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Pay what you owe. This is what he's saying. And then he comes in verse 8 and he says, owe no man anything. So pay what you owe. Basics of life. Pay your taxes. You can't get out of them, right? Pay your bills. How many of you agree that's good life advice? Make sure that you don't get bills that exceed the amount of income that you have coming in because you need to pay your bills. And verse 7 is not just talking about our financial obligations to other people. It's talking about paying our debt of honor and our debt of respect that we owe to others as well. From the time our children are born, what do we teach them to do? We teach them to respect mom and dad. We teach them to respect their teachers, their authority. Guess what? When you graduate and you start a career, how many of you here have a boss? Yeah, so you have to respect them, right? And honor the people that God's placed over you. And so the point is, owe no man anything. Pay what you owe. Pay your bills. Pay your taxes. Pay honor. Pay respect. Don't leave it out there on the table. Don't just be dismissive of that. Go through life and owe no man anything. Now, this is great life advice. How many of you would agree that this is pretty good life advice right there? I'm not going to ask if you wish you had done it better, okay? We won't ask that this morning, but it's good life advice. Well, why? Let's jump ahead just for a minute. Look at verse 10 with me. And all I want you to look at is the very first line in verse 10. It says this. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Why is it great advice not to owe anybody anything? When you owe a debt to somebody, you take the risk of injuring or harming your relationship with that person. How many of you would also agree that sometimes when you bring money into a relationship, it can make that relationship awkward and it could even ruin that relationship? I won't ask you to raise your hands if you've experienced that before. But we all know the truth of what happens often when money gets involved, how it can turn a relationship awkward and it can turn one sour really quick. And that's the overarching principle here. Why shouldn't we owe people money? Because we don't want to take the chance of doing them harm, injuring them by not being able to pay back the debt or by doing something that's going to hurt the relationship. So he's saying live debt free. Now, I don't have a lot of time to spend on this because it's not the overall purpose of the passage, but it's here. And there's some great life advice. So just a couple things real quick. If we're going to live debt free, we've got to learn how to exercise self-control and resist impulse purchases. There's a really great small two-letter word in the English alphabet, and it goes N-O, N-O. All right, I got to keep you all engaged with me this morning, helping me out. The word no, it's not a terrible word. How many of you parents have ever had to teach your kids as they're growing up and you have a conversation like this before you go into Target? Just because we're going into Target doesn't mean we need to buy something in Target. Just because we're going to walk by the toy section doesn't mean that one of those toys is calling your name and it has to end up in the buggy and come home. As a parent, I've gotten really good at saying those, that one little word, no, 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 no. We can go down the list. That's a really good advice. We don't need to buy everything that we see. We can learn how to exercise self-control. Another biblical principle all throughout the Bible, don't be materialistic and let stuff put you in debt. We don't have to keep up with our neighbors. We don't have to have the latest and greatest of everything that comes out here. We don't need to be, be, be materialistic. We are not citizens of this world. We are citizens of the kingdom of heaven. And that's the biggest overarching principle when we're talking about living debt-free. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. That verse right there is a financial passage. And what our priority needs to be is the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God. And all of our financial decisions, all of our financial obligations should flow through the overarching principle that I need to love God with all my heart, and I need to love my neighbor as myself. Oh, no man, anything. Great principle right here. But now he goes on a little bit further, and I'm going to add a little bit to this point. So the the first point is debt-free except for L-O-V-E, okay, except for love. Now, I had to throw that in there because I want this to be memorable. And if I just said debt-free except for love, it's going to be a very forgettable point. But if it's debt-free except for L-O-V-E and you got a little rhyme to it, 
Hopefully it's something that will sink in and everybody's going to be able to remember. So I need you to help me out. When we get to love in verse 8, y'all help me spell it out, okay? We're going to do L-O-V-E. Everybody good? Y'all with me this morning? All right, here we go. It says, oh, no man anything but to L-O-V-E one another. For he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. Now, he just said not to be in debt to anybody except to be in the debt of love. So why is it okay to live with the debt of love? And the reason it's okay to live with the debt of love is because it is a perpetual debt that we will never be able to fully repay. And that's exactly how God wants us to live. He wants us to live where we view every single person that we come in contact with as a person that we need to love. And we owe every person, every person that we come in contact with, our neighbors, our family members, we owe them the debt of love. And so it's something that we better get used to living with. Man, we ought not to wake up every day and be like, oh, man, I got to love today. It's so hard to love. And by the way, isn't it hard to love? (laughs) Sometimes it is. There are certain people that are harder to love than others, but that's a debt that we owe to everybody. And so what we've got to realize is it's fun to live with L-O-V-E. Now, the L-O-V-E, I was listening to a message this week on this passage, and the guy was spelling it out. So I stole this idea from him. But the second he started saying L-O-V-E, if you want to know where my mind goes, I started thinking about it's fun to stay at the Y-M-C. Okay, yeah. For whatever reason, because he just kept saying L-O-V-E, so that just my brain started going in that direction. So this morning, it's not fun to stay at the YMCA. It's fun to live with L-O-V-E. That's the E right there. Taught you something. I was like wondering, how do you do the E? I actually looked up like how to use your body to make the letter E, and I found it. I was like, oh, that's not that tough right there. So everybody, let's all stand up. We're going to sing. It's fun. No, just kidding. You don't have to. (laughs) I'm not going to make you do that. The only reason why, again, I am making a fool out of myself this morning is because I want to drive this home where we don't forget it. Debt-free except for L-O-V-E. And it's, it's fun to live the way that God wants us to live. It's the best kind of life that we could possibly live. Now, what I love about this verse is he says, Owe no man anything but to love one another, for he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. The Bible is not frivolous. Love is not frivolous. Love is not something that we just, we all hold hands and we sing kumbaya or we go back to our elementary school with Barney. I love you. You love me. We're a happy family. It's not as simple as that. It's complex. It's got some real teeth to it. It's got some real meaning. And he backs it up and he shows us some ways that we actually should be loving. So everybody look at verse 9. So love fulfills the law. How does it fulfill the law? Look at verse 9. He says this. For this, thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Thou shalt not covet. And if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. So what he does here is he brings in the last five of the Ten Commandments. And all of these are prohibitions. These are things that we should not do against our neighbor. But they overemphasize the point that love will perfectly fulfill the law. Think about it like this. If you love your neighbor, will you sleep with their spouse? The answer to that is no. Not if you love their neighbor, thou shalt not commit adultery. If you love your neighbor, will you kill them? That's a pretty simple one right there. If you love your neighbor, will you steal from them? If you love your neighbor, will you lie about them? If you love your neighbor, will you covet what they have and desire to take it from them? And the answer to that question is no. And Paul's point is, and any other commandment, any other law, if you love your neighbor as yourself, you will fulfill the commandment because love doesn't just simply stop at the prohibition. It doesn't just say, well, as long as I don't kill my neighbor, I can do anything else that I want to to him. That's not what it says. Love fulfills the law. Love actually seeks the good of another person. Love doesn't want to hurt or injure or harm. Love wants to do good. That's why love perfectly fulfills the law. And so here's a practical application before we move on. Love great. Love great. 
Don't just stop at not committing adultery. How about you love your spouse spouse selflessly and sacrificially? How about you get up every day and you die to yourself and you work on your marriage and you work on your home? And in so doing, if you love your spouse the way that Christ loves the church, then guess what? You're going to love your children better and you're going to be a better neighbor and the light of Jesus is going to be seen more clearly in your life. Don't just stop at not committing adultery. Hey, don't just not kill your neighbor. How many of you agree? That's a really low bar right there. I mean, that's about it. Like, I mean, that, you're, he's not, by the way, that says a lot about us too. God's not expecting a whole lot out of us in our sinful condition. Like, don't kill. I mean, that's, that's basic. But in the New Testament, he goes further. He says, if you hate your neighbor, you're guilty of breaking the law of wanting to kill your neighbor. So don't just stop at not killing. Don't just stop at not hating. You know what we've learned in Romans 13 and 12? To do good to them that persecute you. To seek the benefit and the welfare of others. Don't just be satisfied as, well, I'm not killing anyone and I'm doing pretty good. No, love and invest in the relationship. Hey, don't just not steal and covet. Be content with such things as you have. You know what? Love is happy, genuinely happy for the success of other people. And it doesn't get jealous and it doesn't get envious. Love is content. And you know what we need to do? We need to get up every day of our lives. And we need to start with the basics of just being grateful and thankful and not thinking about what I don't have and what they do have and what I wish I had and how I've been wrong. Stop. If you're saved, if you're a child of God, you got it better than you could ever possibly deserve. So be content with what you have. And in so doing, hey, you're going to fulfill the law and you're going to root for other people and you're going to be their cheerleader. Love great. You understand? Debt free, except for L-O-V-E. Basics of life. These are the, the Ten Commandments, but yet they're so difficult sometimes to fulfill and to live out in our lives. So Love, great. Master that. Go a step further. Don't just be happy that you're not breaking the rules. Go the extra mile and watch God and the light of Jesus shine brightly through you. So that's point number one. Here's point number two. And I only have two points today. That's it. But this one has three applications. And man, it's so good to where we're at in life. Here's point number two. You snooze, you lose. Okay, we're going all the way back. This is, I told you, you could not get a more fitting message for a graduate emphasis Sunday. You snooze, you lose. Now, did you know there's a second part to that? I never knew that. I've always heard you snooze, you lose. But there's a second part to that phrase. If you snooze, you lose. And if you snore, you lose more. I thought that was so good right there. I, I enjoyed that. I appreciated that. And by the way, it's one thing not to get up and get moving. If you're snoring and you're out cold, you're really going to miss out on things that are happening in life. Now, I got to take a minute and I got to commend all of the college graduates in here. Obviously, at some point in their life, you learned how to stop hitting that snooze button, get up out of the bed, go get your things done. And what a great accomplishment. I think we all deserve a round of applause, college graduates. I mean, you learned this lesson. And guess what? You get to do it every single day for the rest of your life until you don't need an alarm clock to get up anymore because you can't sleep at night because you're old and stressed. And no, just kidding. (laughs) Not supposed to be that either. Um, To the high school graduates' parents, I got to commend you. You've done a good job at helping your kids get out of bed every day for the past 13 years, and uh, hopefully that will start kicking in. And to the K-5 graduate parents, I just got to say good luck on the next 13 years. No, just kidding. It is a wonderful ride. It goes by incredibly fast. Um, Our oldest is graduating on Thursday, and it is hard to believe that We are at this point. I remember kindergarten graduation like it was yesterday, and uh, what an awesome ride it truly has been, and lots of things to learn all along the way, but God has been good. Now, where are we going with this? How does this apply? Look at verses 11 and 12. The Bible says this, and that knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. The first practical application from all of this is wake up. That's what Paul's saying. There's there's three time references that he uses in verse 11 and the beginning of verse 12. The first one is this. Now it is high time. Essentially, the alarm is going off. There's no more chances to hit the snooze button. You better get out of bed. You better get up. You better start paying attention because if you don't, you're going to miss out on some incredible opportunities that God has in store for you. So wake up. It's high time. 
Stop sleeping. Pay attention. There's some things that we've got to get right in our lives. There's some things that we've got to do. And then he says right after that, he says this. Our salvation is nearer than when we believed. Our salvation is nearer than when we believed. Now, you might be wondering, like, why are we talking about salvation? I thought that I got saved the day that I put my faith and trust in Jesus. you got to understand that our salvation is an incredible gift from God. It's amazing. Your salvation involves your past, your present, and your future, okay? So in the past, when you got saved, there's a big word in the Bible, and the word is called justified. And when you recognize that you were a sinner, and you recognize that there was nothing you could do about your sins, and that you deserved eternal punishment, that you were headed to an eternity in hell, and then you realize that Jesus Christ died, and he paid your punishment for sin on the cross, and you believed in Jesus as the only way to life, and as the only way to salvation, the judge took his gavel, God in heaven, and he said, justified, declared righteous. No longer am I looking at you as a sinner, but I see Jesus Christ and there is no more condemnation. How many of you will praise the Lord for the day that you got saved? Man, don't ever forget that. You are justified. You are declared righteous. But then there's the present. There's sanctification. Sanctification is a grueling, brutal process where God takes our sinful human nature and he transforms it into his image and likeness. It's the process every day of where he's trying to change us from who we are as sinful human beings into a picture that looks more and more like Christ. And guess what? We're never going to arrive while we're on earth. Every day of our lives, we're going to have to get up and we're going to have to fight the fight. The things that I want to do, I don't do. And the things that I don't want to do, I do. Do any of you ever feel like you're living there? Oh, man, do you, ever, do you ever just get tired and just wish it would be easy to just do right? Do you wish it would just be easy to be thankful even? <laughs> sometimes that's, the, like, that's a basic of life, but sometimes that's so hard. We get such a bad attitude so easily, and we grumble and complain. Hey, the process of fighting to be grateful and to be thankful and all of those things that we know are right to do, that's called sanctification. That's why Paul at the end of his life said, I fought a good fight. It will be a fight till the day you die. But you know what this verse is talking about? This verse is talking about our future and it's talking about glorification. And I praise God that my salvation is nearer than the day that I believe. Because when I say, see Jesus, the fight is going to be over. I'm going to be transformed into his image and likeness. I'm going to live with him forever in glory where I'm going to be like him. I'm going to be perfect. Wow, what a day that that's going to be. We don't have to fight this fight anymore. How many of you believe that glorification is a pretty awesome thing? Are you looking forward to the day of your salvation? It's nearer than when you believed. Your glorification can begin now. That's the whole point of this process. We won't fully arrive, but when we start striving to do the basic things that God asks us to do, we start getting a little bit of a taste of heaven on earth, and there's not a better way to live. And then he ends by saying this, the night is far spent, the day is at hand. Make no mistake about it. Eternity is closer today than it was yesterday. The night is far spent. It's, it, the, the darkness is about to be gone. The dawn of the rising sun is coming up. And you know how Jesus wants us to live our lives? He wants us to live our lives like when you wake up right before the alarm's about to go off and you're like, oh, I wanted that last minute of sleep. It's that sense of you know you got to get up. No, he wants us to recognize that literally any second now the trumpet could sound and our Lord and our Savior could return and he's coming back and he's going to get us and he's going to call us home and he's going to wrong make every right wrong, I mean every wrong right, and he's going to fix all the problems of this earth. That is a day that we are looking forward to. Jesus is coming back and today could be the very day. Now, I remember when I was in high school, I heard messages like this, and it scared me. And I was like, oh, man, I really want to get married, and I want to have kids. And now I'm married and have kids, and I say, even so, come, Lord. No, just kidding. I don't do that. I love God has been so good. He's blessed our lives in incredible ways. And it's not necessarily wrong to desire those things, but we are not citizens of this world. And there is a better day coming. There is a glorious day coming where we're going to be forever in the presence of Jesus. And he's telling us to wake up because he's got something for us to do. And he doesn't want us to miss out on his plans for our lives and the people that we can point to Jesus through our lives. And so I got to just simply say this to all of us here this morning. We got to stop sleepwalking. Any of you here ever had a problem with sleepwalking before? 
I, I used to, when I was younger, I think I've been cured of this. I haven't done it in a long time, but I used to sleepwalk all the time. Um, when we first got married, I could tell you all kinds of stories, but in my sleep, I'm like a superhero too. I save the day all the time when I'm sleepwalking. Well, there's one night in particular, it was like two o'clock in the morning and I'm standing up on the bed and I'm spinning the ceiling fan around as fast as I can. And she's like, what in the world are you doing? And I said, there's a giant tarantula and I'm saving your life. She didn't even appreciate it. She just said, go back to sleep. That was it. That's all I got for my heroics right there. No, anyway, that was just one. But I, when I was back in college, there was one night in particular that I've never forgotten this night. I, again, it was like two o'clock in the morning. I wake up and for whatever reason, I think it's like daytime and I got to go to class. So I get a shower. I do my hair. I brush my teeth. I went to Pensacola Christian College back in the day when they made you wear a shirt and tie every single morning to class. So I tied my tie. I put it on. I grabbed my bag. I left my room. I went down the stairs. I was out into the lobby and I was just right at the door and I was just about to push the door and go outside. And all of a sudden I was like, you know what? This feels kind of weird. I'm just going to go back to sleep. And I went back up and I got back in bed and I woke up the next day and I was like, wow, I really did that last night. And you might be wondering what in the world does this have to do with this point? And here's, here's what it is. What I realized about that night is I was literally one step away from opening that door. And if I would have went outside, that door would have closed behind me. And all of a sudden I would have been out of my dorm at 2 a.m., locked out with no way to get back in. I would have had to walk around that campus, try to find a security guard, try to explain to them why in the world I was all dressed up and say, I have a sleepwalking problem. They're going to be like, yeah, right. Okay. Anyway, I, I, I think about that all the time because I think it applies to where we're at in our lives today. There are so many people, and we're just going through the motions of life, just like the rest of this world. And you know what we're living for? We're living for today, and we're living for the pleasures of this life, and we're living for our, our, how, our careers and our families and the next vacation, and we're not really awake to the reality that at any moment Jesus could return. At any moment, we could be in his presence and I'm afraid that when we wake up, we're going to realize, oh no, what have I done? I've locked myself out. I've kept myself from the blessings and the goodness of God that he wanted to pour out on my life because I was asleep and I was just going through the motions and I was just following along with everybody else. Can I tell you this morning, we got to wake up. I don't want to get to the end of my life and look back with regrets. I want to get to the end of my life and know that I was paying attention to the basics of life. That one day, soon, we're going to stand before God and we're going to give an account. And I want to hear those words, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Wake up. Loving one another, the things that we're talking about, these are fundamental to everything that God wants to do and all the blessings he wants to pour out on your life. But not only do we need to wake up, we need to cast off. Look at verse 12. He says this, The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Have you ever woken up? Maybe you have slept past your alarm and you looked at the clock and you're like, oh man, I got 10 minutes where I got to be somewhere. And you know what happens? That sense of urgency starts kicking in. And the first thing that you do is you start taking off your pajamas and you start getting changed because what you wear at night is not necessarily appropriate to wear in the day. I'm glad people don't show up to work in their pajamas. That would probably be a little bit weird. And the point that he's trying to get across here is what you wear in the night is not suitable for the day. The, the point is to stop doing the things that you used to do when you were in darkness. When you believed, the Bible tells us that you became a children, a child of the light. We are no longer in darkness. We now live in light. And I'm thankful that once again, this is not vague. He gives us some very practical things that we can sink our teeth into. What are some things we need to cast off? Look at verse 13. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting, and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying. Now there's six words here, but two of them combine, and there's really three essential big ideas that he's trying to get across. And the first one is this, cast off rioting and drunkenness. Cast off the, the wild parties and the excessive living. That's what he's trying to say. Now do you know what our world tells our high school graduates? You know what, what the world makes a big deal of when you go to college? All those big parties, a lot of drinking, living it up, having a great time. And you know what the Bible says? Cast that off. 
Jesus could return at any moment. We don't have time for that type of frivolity. And by the way, when you're drunk or when you're high, guess what happens? Something takes over our senses. And more often than not, very regrettable decisions are made in those moments. Come to our CCR program on Friday night and talk to those people. Talk to people in here that have been saved. And you know what I'm talking about. You've experienced that in your past. And you know what the Bible says? Cast that off. Stop thinking that way. Stop living that way. Hey, when you're bored, when you're lonely, when you're tired, when you're discouraged, when you're feeling hopeless, don't even think about the relief that drugs and alcohol and partying can bring to your life. You got something better. You got the Holy Spirit of God that is inside of you. The Bible says, be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. You want someone to take control of your life and take it over that's going to satisfy and fulfill you in rewarding ways? Let the Holy Spirit of God... Do the work that he wants to do in your life. Cast off rioting and drunkenness. Then he says, cast off chambering and wantonness. Anybody wondering what those two words mean? Those are some really old English words right there. The, the word, um, this, this phrase has to do with sexual sin. Chambering is an old English word that has to do with the bedchamber, and it refers to lewd, immodest behavior in the bedroom, and wantonness has to do with sinful abandon unrestrained indulgence in sexual behavior. That's, that's the idea of what we're talking about. In our country, is, there's no shame. The things that used to be done in night are now being done blatantly out in the day. And I was thinking about like all of this passage, actually, because it's just really talking about unrestrained, just living in our flesh however we want to. And I was thinking about all those commercials that come on for Las Vegas, and what do they say? What happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. Can I tell you, that is one of the biggest lies that Satan will ever tell you. And I think Las Vegas fits this perfect. Man, you go to Las Vegas, there's a lot of drinking. There's a lot of unrestrained spending of money and gambling. And you cannot go to Vegas and ignore the fact that the sexual promiscuity is everywhere. It's on every billboard. You can hardly turn your eyes anywhere when you're walking down that strip without seeing something that is blatantly thrown in your face. And what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas is not true because what happens in the bedroom behind closed doors absolutely sticks with you the next morning when you get up and when you get on the plane and when you go back to your family or when you have to face the consequences of your sin. It's not something that we get easily away from. God created something wonderful in the sexual relationship, but it's supposed to be inside of marriage. And inside of marriage, it's a wonderful gift from God that brings satisfaction and fulfillment, but also brings just that idea of just knowing that your wife is faithful or your husband is faithful and the peace and contentment that comes with that when you don't have to worry about all that extra baggage. I'm telling you, cast that off. Cast it off. And then he says strife and envy. When I think about this phrase, I think, I think about this. I think, hurt people hurt people. You ever heard that before? Hurt people hurt people. Well, who's the hurt people? Every single one of us. We have all been hurt by the lies of Satan. When Adam and Eve sinned in the garden and they questioned God's goodness and we be, have a sinful nature, every lie that we've ever believed and every sin that we've ever committed and everything that we've ever done wrong, it carries with it a stain and it carries with it baggage and it carries with it regret and it carries bitter. There's all kinds of things that come as a result of it. We've all been hurt. We've all been let down. And you know what he says? Cast off strife and envy. If you've been wronged, if you've been overlooked, if you've been belittled, if you've been misunderstood, if you've been abandoned, don't let these thoughts lead to resentment. Don't let them lead to envy. Don't let them lead to fighting. Don't let them lead to revenge. Cast that off. That's what you did in your old nature. Give it to Christ. Let him take care of it. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. He'll take care of it more completely and better than you. But you know what? We need to wake up. Because if we live in our bitterness... And if we live in lack of forgiveness, we're going to miss out on the joy of today and how God wants to use us. And we're going to lock ourselves out of the blessings that he wants to pour out on our lives. Give it to Jesus. Forgive and let it go and trust him and live in the freedom that he's called you to live in. Cast that off. I, 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 there are so many believers that I know struggle with just letting go of the hurts and the wrongs that have been done. And all you're doing is hurting yourself and robbing yourself of the blessings that God wants to give you. And here's the last part of this. If you snooze, you lose. You better wake up, cast off, 
put on. The whole idea is you get up in the morning, you wake up, you take off your night clothes, you put on your day clothes, and you go out and you live your life. And look what he says in verse 14. But put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. Put on Christ. How do we put on Christ? Go back to verse 12 and look at what it says. I love this analogy that he uses. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness. And then he says, and let us put on the armor of light. If you put on the armor of light, essentially you're putting on Christ. Now, I'm going to give you some homework today, okay? We don't have time to go there, and I don't have time to talk about every one of these. But if you want some homework to follow up on this week, go to Ephesians chapter 6, start in verse 10, and read down through the rest of the chapter. And there you're going to find the full armor of God. You're going to find some basic things that you need to put on every single day. You need to put on the truth, the girdle of truth. You need to put on the breastplate of righteousness. You need to get up every day and say, I want to do what's right today. I mean, you want to talk about simple, basic things like making your bed in the morning? Child of God ought to get up in the morning and get into God's word, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Child of God ought to get up every morning and have a desire to want to do what's right. God, please help me today to do what's right in every single area of my life. The child of God ought to want to take the gospel, the good news to other people. Do you want to share what God's done in your life with others? Do you want other people to know how good he's been in your life? Has he been good in your life? Yeah, well, then put on shoes that are trod with the gospel of peace. I mean, there's some incredible things there, just some basics that we need to arm ourselves with every day so we can cast off the old man and we can live for the glory of God and we can not waste today. But my favorite one out of all is above all, taking the shield of faith, whereby you may be able to quench the fiery darts of the wicked. You come to a passage like this and it's sobering because I know that there's people in here that when we start talking about some of these things, there could be people in here right now that are living in the very midst of sinful behavior that you know is wrong and that you know you need to cast off. There could be people in here who have a regrettable past and you've done some things that you wish you could go back and undo. And you know what Satan's going to do? He's going to wake you up every day and he's going to remind you that you're not good enough. And he's going to say, you messed up too big and there's no coming back from this. And he's going to beat you up and he's going to pound you and he's going to throw those fiery darts at you every single day of your life because he wants to keep you down. And he wants to remind you that you're just, you're just a fallen, broken sinner. But you know what we're supposed to do as believers? There is no more condemnation in Christ Jesus. Take up the shield of faith. You know who our faith is in? Our faith is in Christ. And I love what the Bible says. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us word who believe? Which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead. What is the exceeding greatness of the power of God? It's the resurrection power of Jesus Christ. And what's available to you and me? The resurrection power of Jesus Christ. And I don't care what battle you're fighting. I don't care what past sin you have in your life. It's not greater than the love of Jesus Christ and his forgiveness and his power to enable you to step out there and conquer that area of your life and live for his honor and for his glory. Put on Christ. Pick up that shield of faith and remind yourself that you have been forgiven. You are redeemed. Today is a new day. And it doesn't matter what your past has been. It doesn't matter what you're struggling with today. Unless you don't wake up and you continue to stay in sleep. But if you wake up and you put on Christ and you step out, God can change your situation. And he can use you in incredible ways for his honor and for his glory.